Look, so this is the thing. For the entire past few years, I think if you asked me the question, oh, would the Leafs go out there and trade Marner or trade Matthews or trade Tavares or trade Nylander or whoever it is you want to talk about, anytime the previous few seasons, I kind of would have said the same thing. No, they're not going to do that. Come on. You're talking about these hypotheticals. You just want to do some GM franchise mode stuff. Come on. They're not going to trade Marner. Why would they do that? And, you know, that was always my default answer, because the way the Toronto Maple Leafs built their team, it was so analytically heavy. It was so, okay, we got to take a look at the guys who have expected goals for rates that are super high and have good transition, high danger chances, offensive data and all this stuff. Surround them with the depth. Surround them with these older guys who are veterans, who have experience, who have positive Corsi, and have these two-way defenders that can go out there and do their thing, as well as get competent goaltending. Kyle Dubas built this team a very specific way. The analytical nerd coming out of here and building a hockey team. And that's kind of what the Toronto Maple Leafs have been the previous few seasons. And it's gotten to a point where we know that when it comes to the Leafs, on paper, the analytics say the leaders of this team, offensively, it's Tavares, it's Marner, it's Matthews, it's Nylander. The big four. Heck, big three. Matthews, Marner, Tavares. And I was always in that boat that said, okay, if you're really going to think about trading any of these guys, something drastic, very just calamitous has to happen here with this organization. And that's the opinion that I held for a long time. We would make videos discussing what Friedman would say if one of Marner or Nylander would get traded, or if there were any trade rumors going out there, it would have been, okay, something, something, trade, trade, trade. But after yesterday's loss... Man, things are different. Things feel different. You know? Like, this was a team that was the coagulation of every mathematical equation and analytic and advanced hockey number theory, whatever, whatever, all put into one. This was the Toronto team. This was the best version of Kyle Dubas's Toronto Maple Leafs we have seen since the Shanna plan started in, what, 2014 or whatever it was. But what happened? You played probably the worst team out of all the teams that you have played since that 2013 collapse. Okay, this Canadiens team was struggling at the end of the year. This Canadiens team is not as fast as the Leafs. This Canadiens team is not as skilled as the Leafs. This Canadiens team, their best players, they can't hold a candle to Matthews and Marner when it comes to point production. This Canadiens team was worse than the Columbus team last year, in my opinion, just in terms of the way they were playing and the momentum they carried. This Canadiens team, worse than the 2019 Bruins, worse than the 2018 Bruins, worse than the 2017 Capitals, worse than the 2013 Bruins. That team went to the finals, by the way. Same thing with the 2019 team. So this Canadiens roster was the worst one, and you go up against the best version of the Shanaplan Leafs. And what happens? The same thing that we're used to seeing happen, happens. It's not a Game 7 collapse per se, because collapse implies that they had it at some point. They did not have it. They just completely didn't show up in Game 7. They collapsed the series, and it's to a point now where you have memes on it was 3-1, to one, it was 4-1, to one, whatever. This one kind of hurts a little bit more, because you absolutely put to shame everybody who put faith in the Leafs this season to actually break that streak. 2004, man. 2004 is a long time ago to not win a playoff series. Heck, even the Vancouver Canucks have won a few playoff series since 2004. The Buffalo Sabres, they were in the playoffs last, I think, 2011. But hey, last time they won a playoff series, they went to the third round, and that was in 2007. And so now you take a look at the top dogs, the analytical darlings, and the guys who are supposed to carry this ship. Mitch Marner. Austin Matthews. Mitch Marner has zero playoff goals spanning back, what, 18 games or something like that? Mitch Marner had the biggest impact with the puck on his stick in this series when he flipped it over the glass in Game 6 in a crucial, crucial penalty kill. 
Austin Matthews, hey, he got one goal. This is a guy who's supposed to be able to score goals on goals on goals, and for the most part, he did that. Hey, the guy won the Rocket Richard. He didn't even play all the games this season. How crazy is that? To miss out on games, not be 100% healthy, and still win the top goal scorer in the league award. Well, I mean, in the postseason, the guy only got one goal in seven games. What, is that because of Carey Price? Is that because Tavares wasn't here? Is that because Muzzin wasn't here? That stopped Matthews and Marner from doing what they're supposed to be doing? What they're being paid 10, 11 million dollars a season to be doing? In a world where we now know the cap is probably not going to rise up in the way that we thought it would back when those contracts were signed? And so now... You take a look at this team, it's another failure in terms of the on-ice results. Yes, best team in Canada, yes, top of the division, yes, all these wins, all these analytics, all the models and everything, it's all good, but on the ice you guys lost. You still lost. You've always lost. This Shanna plan has failed every single year. In 2017 it was okay because Matthews was a new guy. In 2018, I mean you're kind of stretching it a little bit, but you still lost in Game 7. In 2019 you lost to the team that went to the Stanley Cup Finals, is that an excuse? Well you still lost. In 2020, no excuses there. You get shut out in Game 5 by the Blue Jackets in the qualifying round. And now in 2021, it's Carey Price shutting the door. But is it really just Carey Price? I'd been saying to a few of my friends that if Game Game 6 happens with different goaltenders in net, if it's, I don't know, Primo or Allen or whatever in net for Montreal instead of Carey Price in that overtime in Game 6, Toronto wins. Absolutely. Toronto wins. Carey Price was otherworldly in that specific game. But I cannot honestly say the same thing about Game 7. Carey Price was almost flawless in Game 7, not allowing a goal until like the last two minutes. But it's not like Carey Price was the best version of himself then. He was better in Game 6 overtime. This was just Carey Price getting tested every few minutes with low danger chances. Once in a while there would be a big scrum and he would still stand tall because he's able to maintain himself like that. Carey Price is not the reason Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner were not able to produce. They were not able to produce last year either. And now you're taking a look at it. Look at this right here. Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews are both 0-7 and, and have one goal between them in games where the Leafs could have advanced in a playoff series. These are games spanning back the last few years where the Leafs are up on their opponent. All they need is a win to break that curse in so far. And now you think about it and you say, okay, in a flat cap world, in a world where these guys are making so much money, do you now start thinking about trading them? Is Kyle Dubas even still the guy next year? Who else is going to be in this team? I'm honestly at a loss for words at this point because the entire time it was always, okay, we'll give it a few seasons, we'll give it some time, we'll let Marner and Matthews be who they can be in the playoffs. I was always kind of thinking, okay, Marner and Matthews, they're not really noted for being extremely good playoff performers. But does that change this year when they play a struggling Habs team that barely made the dance? I think so. And it doesn't change! doesn't change. Simple strategy for Montreal. Get Philippe Deneau out there, get him on Austin Matthews, and shut the guy down. It works. It works very well. Now you're in a spot where you actually can legitimately have a discussion as to whether or not trading Marner or trading Matthews would be a good, positive thing for this team if you would need to go for a full plan rebuild because the Shanna plan that we have been seeing the past, like, half decade or something, it's not working. It's not working, and now you have all these guys here. Muzzin being out, Tavares being out, Price being Price, that doesn't stop the guys that you want to be at the top from being at the top. That's not supposed to stop Austin Matthews from being able to score goals. It's not supposed to be able to stop Marner from scoring goals either. Now if you ask me, hey, trade Marner, trade Matthews, my honest instinct is I have no idea. No idea. But I'll tell you this, no idea is a lot more in the yes direction than, oh, come on, no, they can't do that. Because that was my reaction before. Anybody asks in the chat, oh, trade Marner, whatever? Like, we had this entire conversation last year in the bubble. People were harping on Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner for not producing. Marner had one good game against Columbus. Every other game, zilch. And we had the videos, hey, people are hating on Marner again. What's going on? What's new? Now it's the same story. 
half a year later, a year later, something like that. Talk to me in the comments what you think. Trade Marner, trade Matthews, trade Dubas, trade whoever. I don't think Nylander should be touched. That guy is great. But either or, there is a huge conversation to have for the Leafs this year, and this is just one very small part of it. Talk to me in the comments what you think of you enjoyed this. This is Josh Rolls in the I-9. And bye. <laughs>